Christ to get in the, the, the model of the mind on which our most basic approach to the patient rests is the idea of the mind as a kind of container into which questions can reach. And that Freud took a step beyond that when he suggested that if the mind was a container, and he was very heavily influenced by his neurological interest, if the mind was a container, it really was better described as a series of containers some of which were different than others. For example, the, the most superficial level of mind could be reached by questions and so forth, conscious mind. There, there was another part of the mind, however, which one could only get material from by allowing an associative process to occur. And finally, there was the deepest level of mind in the Freudian system, which could only be gotten to by allowing that mind to attach itself to someone in the external world. And by means of its so-called transference attachments, you found out what it was that was in that, that deepest subcontainer of mind. So this, this uh, suggested that there was a paradox in Freud's thinking, in the sense that, on the one hand, he said the mind was relatively inaccessible, particularly the most important parts of the mind were inaccessible. On the other hand, he discovered very quickly, almost at the same time, that there were parts of the mind that were not only not inaccessible, they were so accessible that they reached out of this container and attached themselves to the external world. And they were unconscious in a different sense, that is, because obviously you were not unconscious of your transferences. You, you literally did see them, i.e. you missaw the person in front of you to the point of seeing what you expected to see. Right? So you really saw the contents of, of your own mind on the other person. So they were not unconscious in that sense. However, they were unconscious in another sense. They were unconscious in the sense that you were not conscious that those were parts of your own mind. And I compared the mind, therefore, to a kind of absent-minded author who produced material that he didn't even recognize. Furthermore, there was another feature of this absent-minded author that was remarkable. That it turned out that those pieces of mind that he saw on the person of the analyst, the therapist, were pieces of his own experience with other people. So in a sense, he was a kind of unconscious plagiarist. And that what he thought was his own production was in fact the production of previous experiences perhaps authored by quite different people than himself. So I wanted to interest you in, in, in sort of separating ourselves out from the neurological mind and begin to see some of these what seem to me remarkable characteristics of mind. And as David has said, of the two, however, that I began with were other features of mind, one of which was its presence or absence, the fact that the mind can be sent away that is, that's what's called imagination. And I also remark, of course, that we can pursue the fleeing mind of the patient by using our own imagination to follow where they have gone. And I just, the reasons I mentioned the biological and dynamic and actual clinical imaginations was those are the means by which we essentially pursue the way into the experience of the other person. Finally, I, I touch, began to touch on the question of, of that arises from the fact that not only can the mind be absent or present, it also can stand at various distances from us. That is, the mind can be um, distant, it can be very close, it can be uh, retreating, it can be invasive. And uh, my own candidate for the first clinical decision to be made in any interview was precisely that determination, as whether the mind is moving, whether the other person's mind is moving toward us in a moving way. It seemed to me that in order to do clinical work, one had to be into some kind of workable distance from the other person's mind. One had to be close enough to be in contact with it, but not so close that it was overwhelming one, or one was overwhelming it. And I, this whole notion that, that there was a working distance that you could hope to establish, I think comes home to you if you think of it in physical, physicalistic parallel, as if you were literally didn't want to have somebody who physically disappeared from you, nor did you want to have someone who was really literally wrestling with you in the course of the contact. And although those, neither one of those occurrences are, are a problem in psychotherapy, as the patient does sort of sit there, not in the same place, but in fact the mind is capable of either disappearing or coming at us and attacking us. And that experience of being in the presence of someone who, as you say, comes on strong is something that from your own social experiences you know, you know, all uh, very well aware of. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to finish up I, about distance, closeness and distance, and talk about those in, in some of the traditional terms. And then I'm going to go on to another subject, which is the question of how you determine if the person is in the room. How do you find the other? 
Um, now, if someone is disappearing from you, if they are leaving you, if they, if they are losing their mind, say, or if they're hiding from you, even though they're sitting there quite apparently physically present, if indeed they are retreating from you, uh, there have been, in that circumstance, there have been traditional answers that have been recommended to psychiatrists and psychotherapists and all this well as, as ways of dealing, of finding the other person who is so elusive. For example, the, the most famous one, of course, is the most consistent. That is, those patients who were very aloof, very removed, as, as it was said, of the distant mind, those patients, it was very early recommended in the history of psychotherapy, it was recommended that, that you move closer to them. And as typically was the case, they meant physically closer to them. And Ferenzi, for example, one of the most distinguished Freud students, literally had patients sit on his lap, patients who were otherwise inaccessible to it. And that, that physicalistic response to a psychological problem is, of course, a routine, as I mentioned, the most famous <coughs> example in the history of psychoanalysis, where Freud literally tried to press the thoughts out of his patients' heads in his quite logical pursuit of the hidden material. But that that doesn't work. I mean, it, isn't, it isn't a physicalistic problem, it's a psychological problem, but it's approached naturally first through the physicalistic line. And you see how that concept permeates almost everything I'm saying. I'm accusing us of continuing physicalistic concreti concretism, you, may, you might say, in our thinking about psychotherapy. So that, that notion that the way in which to deal with the inaccessible patient is literally to hold them, to physically hold them, to was one answer. Another answer was to, to do what we would now call invading their life space, where you would go live with them, or you would, you would sort of commandeer them by the ubiquitousness of your presence. Those are answers that are still used in the case of many patients. For example, in the treatment of anorexia nervosa, it wasn't many years ago that Peter Sifkinis wrote a well-known paper in which he dealt with the inability to reach the anorexic patient their inability to feel safe in the doctor's presence by literally becoming a kind of nutrient environment for the, for the anorexic person and, and staying with them for very long periods of time, feeding them himself, taking care of his body himself, doing what, uh, uh, what was called anaclytic therapy, in which you essentially invite the patient to lean anaclyt anaclytically against the therapist, quite literally, of course. Now, <clears throat> I think it represents a very significant advance, although I don't think it's been appreciated in quite these terms, or really appreciated. When we begin to escape that physicalistic uh, way of bridging the gap, and begin to think about how we make a mental connection with a distant person. And I myself predict that the, the way in which Heinz Kohut work will be most remembered is on this very basis. You remember Heinz Kohut's problem was that he had narcissistic patients. He had inherited from Freud, as a good orthodox analyst, the Freudian notion that you could not relate to the narcissistic patients because they did not make the object transference jump. Uh, they kept inside themselves and didn't relate to the, to the therapist. That was what Freud said, explained why you couldn't treat them analytically. Now, Kohut nicely turned that problem on its head, essentially, by saying, well, yes, you could relate to them, if you could form not an object transference, but a narcissistic transference, i.e., if you could relate to them where they were, rather than expecting them to jump across to where you were. And in order to relate to them the way to get to where they were, he adopted what is plainly an empathic method. You know, he talks a great deal about empathy, and recommended, for example, that the patient be admired by the therapist, that the patient's utterances be simply repeated by the therapist, that trial mergers with the, with the, um, with the patient be the rule in this, in this kind of treatment. In other words, that the patient who was distant and into himself, as we say, or herself, was to be met by the therapist going to where they were, essentially, rather than standing in the traditional analytic position at a distance, hoping that they would make this kind of jump on their own. Now, that, that's a direct illustration of a psychological answer to the question of personal distance. I don't think that Cohen has appreciated, you know, the extent to which that has been the traditional answer to the problem, not in the analytic literature, but in the existential literature. There it arises from a different problem. It arises from a philosophical issue. You remember that the 
the existential psychiatric world arises in large part from an attempt to answer a specific clinical question. The question being, how do I place myself in the mind of another? How do I see through the eyes of the other? It's not the question of descriptive psychiatry, which is, how do I see the patient? Or it's not the question of, of psychoanalytic psychiatry, how do I collect the material, the materials of the conflictual dynamic unconscious? But instead, instead it's the question, how do I see through the patient's eyes? How do I know how the world looks through the patient's eyes? How do I place myself within the perceptual experience of the patient? That's the phenomenological and, by extension, the existential question. You remember it arose, ironically, out of, out of Kreplin, because one of Kreplin's students was Carl Jaspers, and Carl Jaspers realized, as Kreplin realized, that, he was, that Kreplin was having a great deal of difficulty uh, characterizing the differences between the paranoid cases, because although they, they often had very different outcomes, when you met them, they looked an awful lot alike. From the outside, the paranoid cases were similar. And so what Jaspers did was to try to find out how the paranoid people experienced their world and made that a distinction point between what he called process paranoia and personality paranoia. Well, that's another subject. I don't think he was quite successful in that. But it drew him in to ans asking this fresh clinical question, not how does it look to me, but how does it look to the patient? Now, when you began to ask yourself that question, how do I put myself into another's world, there began to arise answers which were essentially empathic. That is, I have to end the, the basic answer came up, uh, it was brought up most clearly by Binswanger, and it took the form of the, of the basic clinical rule in existential work, the so-called phenomenological, psychological phenomenological reduction, which was the idea that you put aside all your own ideas and simply try to imagine the experience of the other. That you don't try to think about them as a separate person, not try to describe them or form ideas about them, but simply try to imagine what their experience might be, and that uh, that was taken up uh, taken up by a natural-born therapist, one of our most inspired American therapists, Carl Rogers, who felt that if you took up an attitude of what he called unconditional positive regard, if you avoided critical statements about the patient, you could often find yourself in the process of that positive regard and uncritical stance more and more being drawn into the world of the other. Well, so that it, it, as, I, as far as I can see into it, it seems to me that the, that the answer to the question, how do I see through the mind of the other, is essentially the answer to the question, how, how do I become empathic? And that's nothing more really than a sort of a dictionary equation, because uh, what the word empathy means is to put aside your own consciousness and place your own thinking into the mind of another. Not to bring your mind to the other, but to place your own mental process inside inside the experience of the other. <clears throat> the, um, so that it seems to me that the, the most, the, the farthest we've gotten on the issue of how I bridge the gap between myself and another person turns around the issue of empathy. And a great deal of what I'm going to talk about in subsequent discussions of this is going to be about the language of empathy and how you, uh, how you talk when you talk empathically. How you make that... Uh, that jump, which is equivalent to saying, how is, how does one act and talk empathically? That will be for subsequent discussions. Uh, as I say, I'm going to get around not too long from now to the issue of how does one know when one's gotten there? Because obviously no, no method that we develop for becoming empathic is going to be any good to us unless we have some way of knowing when we've arrived. Um, I want you to for all the difficulties of that, I hope you, I hope I can convince you that, that that problem is also central to all the other schools. How do you know when you've got to the unconscious material? It's not an easy question to answer. How do you know when you've arrived at the right descriptive diagnosis? It's not an easy question. And yet it's one thing we all have to obviously get. Now, there are other patients, however, who are not distant from us, who indeed, as I say, come on strong, or come on like gangbusters. Whatever, who as soon as we're as soon as we're in the room, we can feel their movement toward us. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's how you like to make that uh, make that observation, 
I can sort of feel it. I can feel crowded by some people when I'm talking to them. I can feel a kind of insistence or urgency in their movement toward me. I often feel that I can see it best in people's eyes as they sort of reach for you, as opposed to the rather vacant, disappearing eyes of, of people being lectured to, as they were, of, um, uh, or of the person whose mind is, is being lost and leaving the room. The, in any case, that phenomenon, I think, is real that experience of, of, of the mental life of the other beginning to invade your life space, beginning to try to change your thoughts, perhaps under the influence of some very charismatic people, you can find your mind uh, your, your mind really quite in their service. You can find yourself almost seek highly at, at some people, I think, almost before they've begun to uh, talk. When I was a little boy, my, one of my father's friends was a friend of General Douglas MacArthur. And uh, I remember my father having my father never met MacArthur, but his friend spent a fair amount of time with him. And I remember my father telling me once that, that his friend had just said something really quite remarkable, that, that uh, this group of, you know, men in their 40s and 50s had been sitting with the general, and, uh, and, they, and they had been captivated by him and everything. And when they came out, someone said, you know, if he had told us to jump out the window, all building, if they had, we would have done it. And we were relatively independent. They had that kind of capacity to sort of occupy, uh, uh, to, to induce what, what I was talking about, a sort of automatic obedience on the part of some people. A real capacity to invade other people's uh, will, sense of privacy, even the command of their own thoughts. And if you've, uh, if you've had the opportunity to read in the enormous literature that's collecting about Adolf Hitler, you know that he had that capacity in Spain. In fact, they were afraid to send people to see him certain times because of his capacity to occupy other people's minds and, and, and uh, impose his will. But I think we all have had that experience clinically uh, with lesser Adolf Hitlers, with people like many borderline people who were able to come at you in such a way as to really sub subserve your judgment badly. In any case, what has been the ordinary clinical answer to that? I, mean, uh, there are many, I think there are many answers, but in our own uh, sort of modern psychotherapeutic community, one of the first answers was the one that Elizabeth Zetzel gave us. And I uh, know her papers are very well known in this, this city for many years. She was the sort of chief theoretical person in the city. And, uh, and she had a very specific advice in dealing with invasive patients. She said you had to stop the injury. You had to shorten it. Uh, you had to make sure the patient didn't come very often, maybe once every few weeks. And you had to make sure that the topics you discussed were relatively business-like and neutral. If you did not discuss historical subjects, you did not discuss transference. That was the way to deal with, for example, for the people. And it is by no means foolish advice. And, uh, and, and unless one can find some other way to keep oneself being uh, invaded by such people, it, it's, it's a very serious, something to very seriously consider. Um, another very uh, prominent student of this problem has been Otto Kernberg. And his way of dealing with the invasive patient is the exact opposite. Uh, and I don't mean that it means it's wrong, but it, it, it's very interesting that, that, it, that uh, his answer would be so opposite. And remember, he says that when someone is, when you are dealing with, act, as he puts it, active transferences onto you from the patient, that what you have to do is to interpret them immediately. And so what he does, is when he's being invaded, he counter-invades. And if you've ever seen, if you were here when he came a few years ago and interviewed a patient, you know that he's just as good as his word. He does that. He, he attacked the patient throughout the interview. And every time they tried to settle some kind of misunderstanding on Kernberg, Kernberg would, quick as a flash, would point it out to them, indicate that it came from them and it was not him. And the space between the two of them was enlarged, the distance was enlarged by his constant kicking the patient away from him. And I imagine that that is a very effective, certainly, one is not likely to, you know, settle out in too many endearing feelings in that context of being so constantly criticized by those things, and I imagine that does keep down invasive patients to a significant extent. I think it's also a very dangerous thing to do because it can also arouse paranoid reactions on patients' parts, and I don't think it's any accident, as many of you have heard me say before, I don't think it's any accident that Kernberg strongly recommends that his methods be used only in the hospital or where there's a hospital as a backup. I think that uh, that very active uh, knocking away of the invasive transference elements requires that kind of, uh, that kind of backup. In any case, 
I want to interest you, and I'll go into this, as I say, in much more detail in subsequent discussions, but I want to interest you in other ways by which you distance yourself. And uh, you probably can, can imagine already what, what that form might take in my own thinking. For example, uh, when someone is coming at you very invasively, don't forget that you have the same liberty the patient has to disappear. I don't mean now in the concrete sense that the little vessel suggests that you disappear, but in the mental sense that you disappear. You don't have to pay any attention. Now this is this is a very hard thing to get across to people because we're all trained in the medical tradition and, and, and all our psychological <coughs> nursing and all trained. We're all trained to be professional, attentive. You know the wonderful antinomy of adjectives that's used. Uh, friendly but not too warm, uh, observant but not too inquisitive, you know, all this kind of effort to to sort of uh, uh, square the circle of these clinical contrasts. And um, uh, and when I, when I say that it's, to me it is central that you not pay too much attention to some patients, all, all I'm saying is what any good behaviorist would I think accept, that is that if you do pay too much attention, you are in a sense reinforcing certain kinds of things that the patient feels they have a right to do to you. For example, they may feel they have a right to bore you to death, or a right to confuse you, or a right to challenge you in various ways. And if you feel that you're obliged to react to each of those things, to be sort of present when they're done to you, you've essentially taken the patient's bait, it seems to me, and you reinforce it to some extent, their right to that kind of attitude. So what I would, what I would hope you would consider doing is that when you feel that invasiveness coming, that you vacate your mind, that you simply pay no attention, that you think about something else. And if you do that, most of us at least will soon accompany that with some of the expressiveness, the attitudinal, facial, and, uh, and hand things that accompany inattention. Uh, so that the patient will realize that rather than having gripped you, rather than having invaded you, you have left that you are not interested in playing that kind of game with them. Now, that doesn't mean you don't check in occasionally and see what's happening, of course. And, uh, and that's very easily done. But it, in, essentially, it says to the patient, what I think the women in the room are perhaps learning better than the men in the course of their social experiences, that there are, there are times when you had better cool it. And uh, uh, men on the whole don't learn this very well because on the whole there's, they, they take up the aggressor role in, in sexual and in social relationships, not because they want to or because they're equipped for it, particularly because it's imposed. And so it's much more common for women to have to learn how to, uh, to handle an importunate person, an invasive person. And of course, you know, you all follow the, the sequence, Setzel, Kernberg, in this case Havens, in the sense that you uh, you you don't want to have too many dates <laughs> with that person. You, you you cut down the contact. You don't discuss very personal matters with that particular importunate person. You all know that. Furthermore, you may you may act Otto Kernberg, you, which essentially is get your hands off me. You know, and even though they may not, <laughs> even though they may not have put their hands on you, you're essentially direct directly confronting some of them, especially if they become very invasive. But there's another way, and I think the most effective way in the long run, <coughs> particularly clinically, and that is that, that you cool it. And I know too well from my own efforts to interest certain people in me, I know how, uh, I know how brilliantly that can be done. Uh, when I was considerably uh, younger, and I was during the war, and I hadn't been drafted, and I was very eager to get drafted in World War II, and I had not, because of my eyesight, been able to be drafted. I, I was one of the very few men man, something like that, left in the, in the community in which I grew up, and, and so that it was not possible for me to date certain girls that I don't think otherwise would have been terribly interested in, at least in them. And I can still remember a perfectly wonderful girl, who I still know a little bit of, who um, knew that I was interested in her, and knew that it was really awfully nice that we could in, enjoy company a bit, but was perfectly wonderful at making sure I didn't get the wrong idea. And uh, and she would, in the nicest way possible, distance herself from me. I mean, if I looked like I was getting excited or too enthusiastic, she would a sort of a wan smile would come over her face, or or she would look just a tiny bit tired, or her mind would wander, and she was essentially vacating the relationship for a little while, lest I become, you know, too reinforced in my 
inappropriate eagerness, my misunderstanding that my sort of draft status was more important to this relationship than my personality. And, uh, <laughs> now, those things are even even more important clinically because al although in that situation my self-esteem was very much on the line, of course, I probably would have survived a, a franker approach to my limitations. Uh, but in the clinical situation where people are very delicately poised, uh, cooling it is much more important, I, much more valuable, and either altogether disappearing like Zetzel or, or making frank and critical comments. So, uh, Kernberg doesn't think they're critical, but I've heard them, I know they must be critical patients, making frank and critical comments in Kernberg. So, again, I hope you will consider this, uh, this tuning of yourself, if you like. Maybe that's better than distance, tuning yourself. I, I could have adopted this whole line of thought not to distance, but to cold and hot, or to high and low musically, in some sense. So that you tune yourself down, you might say, or tune yourself out even, uh, in this business. And some of you know how much, how fond I am of, of Wittgenstein's wonderful line about it. Every word is like a note struck on the keyboard of the imagination. And here I would say not only words are like notes, but attitudes, noises, tones of voice are all keyboard struck on the, uh, the notes struck on the keyboard of the imagination. And as you find that someone is coming on awfully strong or seems terribly full of themselves or something of that kind, of, allow yourself, you know, just a, a trace of boredom. Don't, don't feel yourself fixed in those, uh, those awful clinical attitudes of uprightness, correctness. Let yourself feel what you really feel in that situation so that you allow yourself an honesty, which is not only a relief to you, but it's a really much more level kind of thing than the, these clinical charades that we play with these difficult people, and which involve us in terrible misunderstandings as a result, well, seems to me. I don't imagine that you will, if you're, if you're actors and actresses at heart, as some of us are, you will find it fun. You will, you will love to perhaps even overdo it a little bit uh, in the effort to explore your, uh, your, uh, your freedom take up with some very narcissistic person. And I, I thought, in, in my understanding, the high sign of clinical narcissism is when the patient does not notice you, does not observe your indifference, does not listen to you, but regards their own utterances as such profound interest that they go on quite apart from whether there's anybody there or not, essentially. And you can wonderfully titrate the extent of clinical narcissism by the amount of indifference that you express without it being observed. And, there, and don't worry, there are people, you know, who go on talking even after the roof falls in. They hardly notice that. They're so deeply infatuated with their own utterances. But when, for example, you have somebody who is really bustling with his own importance, and chattering along, and wonderfully uh, convinced that you must be listening, even though, even though he doesn't notice that you're not, uh, try something, shake him a little, you know, or her, you know. For example, um, do something like this. I mean, to say, this is only for those of you who like uh, the uh, dramatic side of clinical work. Um, say something like, I mean, he's talking on about something. You know, and cough. When you don't cough the ordinary way, because he won't notice it. He'll just think you're coughing. But if you cough like this, uh, <coughs> it, <laughs> what it should do to, to anybody who's attentive to another person, you say, What's the matter with this person? That's what you should say, right? <laughs> have they got have they got something stuck in their throat? I mean, that's the sort of thing that someone in tune with their environment wonders. Or is the, is my psychiatrist going crazy? You know, what's happening? You know, but, but and you only would do that with someone you knew was clinically narcissistic enough, so that they would really hardly notice it at all. And just see how outrageous you can be before they pay attention to it. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, exaggerating. What you can, you'll be astonished at the extent to which they do not pay any attention at all. And you carry on some kind of weird paroxysm for 20 or 30 seconds, and they, they feel a little bit miffed that they're being interrupted, but they don't care goddamn about you. And the fact that you sound like you're obviously expiring from some terminal lung disease doesn't interest, doesn't interest them. Really, does not interest them at all. 
and, that, and, and there's clinic. You know, I talked about the extremities of, clinic, of automatic obedience. There are some of the extremities of, of the narcissistic personality. And, and don't kid yourself. Uh, uh, you won't meet very big examples of that, except among manic patients in a hospital like this, until you go into practice and have some of the members of the faculty and the most successful uh, members of the community as your patients. And then you'll begin to realize what self the limits that self-absorption can actually reach. So that this whole notion of the of the clinical work being a kind of shaking or shaping is, is one of the things that, uh, that I hope to interest you in, as opposed to a sort of rational talking to about an external reality or the patient. And I, I think that does spring out of this uh, seeing mind in part as as this invasive retreating. Substance. Oh. Mm -hmm. like How do you uh, put that together with the intent to have it with the patient? My initial reaction is that clinically, uh, it's the utility right. of that, but it feels somehow right. unimpacted. Oh, well, it is unimpacted. Yeah. It's most unimpacted. And I'm not, This, these things will mostly be about variance of empathy. But, um, I'll, and I'll, but I'll talk about some other things to do too. And I don't want. And I'm going to say this shortly, but I don't want this discussion of empathy to be a recommendation for me. In many places where empathy is the worst thing on earth you can do. Now, in this case, of a very narcissistic person, you are, cannot empathize. And indeed, empathizing with it might be the worst thing on earth. It might reinforce this self absorption. Now, you might want to work a la cohort and go through that phase, but you might not want to either. And, uh, you know, this would not. Uh, this would not put you in, in that situation at all. Indeed, it might create, you might make it possible, because if indeed that person noticed you and became interested in you, and really you took up a part in their lives, then you might be setting the stage for some kind of share. But until you exist, how can you empathize with the person? How can they experience your empathy? Right? And many of these people are not able to experience empathy from another person, probably because they may never have had it, but they may never experience empathy from another person until they pass this first step of recognizing the existence of other people. Remember I said at the end of last time that there are two blocks to, to empathic work. One is the patient that doesn't exist, the patient you can't find. Another is some of the things, the problems we have. But I could have added this as another blocked empathy. If the patient doesn't admit the existence of an external world independent of himself, then, then how can there be an adjoining? But I, it's not empathic. Right? Okay. Just, I don't want to digress too mm -hmm. much, but my understanding of what Koha would say is that the therapist's task is to be able to empathize with the narcissistic need mm -hmm. in that patient. Right. And um, to go through uh, an empathic understanding of what the injury must have been, mm -hmm. what, right. what was left unsatisfying right. to them. Right. And, and okay. let, me, let me add that your first point a little bit, the idea that the, that the narcissistic patient is at a immature point, i.e. they see themselves as grand, for example. They see themselves as omnipotent or grand. And although that's a, a, maybe a normal phase in development, Coet says it is a normal phase, but it isn't. But Coet says a normal phase, therefore you get with that in the hope of turning that I am wonderful into there are wonderful things I would like to be because of the ego ideal. And that's the central Freudian notion that, that Coet works for. Remember Freud suggesting one of his brilliant in one of his brilliant theoretical leaps that 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 the ego ideal, that is our sense of our ideals, our purposes in life, those are the inheritors of the infantile narcissism, i.e. Uh, we go from thinking that we're wonderful already to forming ideals of what we might like to become. That's, that was one of the steps of maturity that, that, uh, that Kohut has really tried to expand in life. And so therefore he said if you're going to take someone down that path, you better get with them at the beginning of it. And then gradually transform that infantile megalomania into a mature ego ideal. But you won't be able to do that from outside. You have to do it from where the person is. Okay? <clears throat> well, now, I'm not going to... It's already 
we've already been almost three quarters of an hour, but I'll, let me just introduce the subject I'll talk about next. I, I um, and this is a large subject, and I hope uh, much of this must be seem abstruse, perhaps or boring to you. And this, uh, but this is one of the parts of all the, that's most important to me, and also one of the parts that's most difficult for me. When we get to talking about the language of empathy and counterprojective and introjective speech and projective speech, some of these things that I've thought about a long time, and I, they're at least prescriptive in the sense I can say what I mean, and you can take it or leave it. But this part is, uh, is uh, I find myself very troubled by it and uh, uncertain about it. And therefore, I'm sure even more confusing. Um, the subject is basically finding the other person, finding the other person. Uh, now, when I when we ask ourselves how we do that, we come upon right away some uh, some observations that from the history of psychiatry that we can make ourselves that allow us to give a provisional answer. I'm, let me introduce it to you by giving a clinical anecdote, which some of you I'm sure are familiar with, often used it. Uh, in, I was sitting in this very room about a year or two ago with the medical students, and, and, um, and a, a young man came in who, whose chief complaint came into this room. He came into the hospital with a chief complaint of, of burning in his skin, tense burning throughout his skin. And uh, he had, uh, in addition to that complaint, formed an idea as to where the, the source of the burning. His idea was that a man, unspecified, unnamed, had placed a, some sort of radioactive device in the patient's brain, and that this radioactive thing was viewing out and causing the burning in the skin. So that he presented as essentially a paranoid psychosis, <clears throat> not an unfamiliar uh, sequence. Um, in the course of my chatting with him, with the students, uh, we found out what you so often, I think you so often find out with paranoid people, is that he had formed a quite a close attachment to another man. You might call that homosexual if you want to. That would be in keeping with Freud's formulation, and this helps. It helps us a little bit. Uh, and that, in that close and rather credulous attachment that the paranoid person typically forms with this hero that he wants, this man had, in the course of that, disappointed him, badly disappointed. He, he felt came out later, he double-crossed it. That's a very typical sequence, leading to a paranoid break. Well, that didn't do it by itself, although it set up a great deal of uneasiness in this young man's mind. And he then went home to his mother, of his birth mother, and she had said, and she said to him, get lost, essentially. He'd been a troublesome young man for years. Uh, and then he went to his stepmother, and she said the same thing, get lost again. And at that point, the burning in his skin began. And as he told me that, I felt, as he was describing the, this, these three rejections by his beloved father substitute, I thought, then his two mothers, I had this, I had burning feeling in my own skin. And I, with that came the mental content that sort of burns me up, I mean, this, the way he was treated. I was being sympathetic or empathic with him, and in that setting, I had the same physical sensations he did. He, at the same time, then remarked to me, he was surprised that in the course of this exchange, that he had lost his burning feeling. And then we went back and we talked about it some more, and I got it, I lost it after, at that point. And then it came back to me as we talked again about what it felt like to be out that much in the cold. Mm -hmm. And then he said it had diminished, although it then came back, and, and although it came back to a lesser point. Now that, that is, I use that as evidence of my being of my having been empathic with the patient. That is, I'm using the, the sharing of a sensation, using the sharing of a sensation as a sign of successful empathy. And it's one of the, one of the remarkable peculiarities of shared sensations and shared emotions, we'll talk about soon, is that when one does that, it, it's almost as if there was a given quantity of sensation or emotion that if you take it on, it becomes less in the patient. Now that, that sounds like a sort of libido theory revisited or something, and I don't pretend for a moment that that's the explanation. But it, it is a clinical finding, it seems to me, that there seems to be some kind of quantitative aspect to this, so that the experience of sharing seems to be a, 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 a what well, seems to be what the word sharing means. The word sharing means to apportion or divide. It's almost as if the thing was apportioned to someone that, to someone else. In this case, the, the therapist. So. My first answer to this question, how do you find the other, is you consult yourself. 
Right. You see if the kinds of sensations or emotions you're having bear some kind of correspondence to what you understand are the sensations in someone else. Now, this is, of course, very dramatic when the patient comes in and presents with a complaint that my skin is burning up, and then you're sitting with him and you find to your surprise that your skin is burning up. That comes as a kind of objectivity into the situation, which is, uh, which is hard to, to make light of. However, if you think of the way in which empathy is defined and the way, above all, in which empathy is illustrated, for example, in the standard psychological textbooks, this suddenly doesn't become so odd. For example, it used to be, I don't know whether it still is, it used to be the case that in sort of the college textbooks of psychology, when they'd get to the section on empathy, they'd show a picture. And the picture would be of a pole vaulter. And the pole vaulter would be going over the top of the bar, and at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the uh, area, the, the, the spectators would all be twisted in a posture very similar to him. And this is used as as an illustration, literally, an illustration of empathy. And now, in that case, we have a behavioral representation of empathy in the postures of the, of the spectators, which are so suggestive of a, of, a, of a being with, so to speak, this vaulting figure. So that my, that when I speak about uh, sharing sensations or emotions, I think I'm only talking about the same thing, but now on the affective level. And later on in these, in these talks, I will try to interest you in, the, in what I think is the cognitive equivalent of that. And uh, that is that I will try to interest you in the idea that, that you can determine how close you are to another's mind by the extent to which you can complete their utterances. That is the extent to which you can read their minds, essentially. And that the extent to which, as they start a sentence, you just silence yourself, of course, you can try to finish it and see how close you are to where they are. And that's, an, in a sense, the most objective evidence of all, because if you can literally finish what they're saying to yourself while they're saying it, that suggests to me that you're in tune, resonating close to them. I don't know what the proper language, we all use concretistic language, but it seems to me you're with some mental process of theirs, whatever the language you choose to describe it. And you'll find, I don't think it, maybe it'll astonish some of you, some of you maybe have been doing this all your lives, it really surprised me the extent to which one could do that with many personalities quite consistently. I mean, I don't mean word for word always, but to, to a very large extent uh, with the person. So we have there now cognitive, uh, sensational, affective, and bodily uh, signs of being with the other. Now, I'm going to stop uh, after about five minutes more and then we can talk a little bit, but I want to, I want to put that those phenomena into a larger context, and particularly in the context of this building, uh, because this is the place where Elmer Southern, our, our founder, our founding father, really, uh, worked. And Elmer Southern uh, suggested in, I think, 1904, that every psychiatrist should understand what he called the empathic index. And the empathic index was the extent to which he could feel what the patient felt. And, uh, he did that because he thought that, and as was felt by so many people at that time, that, that you couldn't really empathize with schizophrenic people, and therefore if you couldn't empathize with a patient, it might mean that they were schizophrenic. Interestingly enough, that was also Eugen Bloiler's notion, and uh, it was one of the reasons that, that Bloiler is taken up often as an existential psychiatrist, because he got into the affective sharing aspects of psychiatry to an unusual extent. By the way, Bloiler got into a lot of things besides descriptive psychiatry, as you can see it, he got into a great deal of psychoanalysis. Anyway, so the, the, the concept of an empathic index is something that, uh, that may well be the, the most original creation that came out of this, out of this building in its entire history. Anyway, uh, so that the notion of an empathic index, uh, the notion of what I call now observer signs or observer effects, goes way back in the history of psychiatry. Now, the most famous example of, of observer signs or diagnosis by, by noting the impact of the patient on you, the observer. The most famous example of that is what the Germans call Prekoxgefühl. That is the, the feeling of eeriness or strangeness in the presence of a schizophrenic person. That's, uh, there have been a number of... Uh, everybody, every year and probably every few months, somebody publishes a paper in which they show you how to really diagnose schizophrenia. 
and uh, you know, nowadays you have 18 symptoms over six months, and that's the way to do it. Uh, last year it was dissociative processes. The year before that it was uh, passivity signs, you know, thought capture and uh, hallucinatory uh, invasiveness, blah, blah, all those things. But one of the most consistent contenders for that dubious title of the of how to the pathognomonic sign of schizophrenia is the prepax gefühl. It's more, it's more popular in Europe than it is in this country, but it was a recent paper about five years ago in which a hundred German psychiatrists were asked how they diagnosed it, and that was the thing they thought was most alive. Some of you know one of my tawdry efforts to immor memorialize myself, and, and that was to, to take a, a, a component of the Precoxgefühl and call it Haven's Assign. That is that one of the ways one of the ways in which precox before it's manifested is that you can often feel a kind of eeriness or elevation of small hairs at the back of your neck. And that's haven sign. You'll feel it in the presence of, of some schizophrenic people. You'll also feel it in the uh, in the presence of horror movies or, or you know, read the turn of the screw on a dark night example sometime. Like Henry James's magnificent story about eeriness. And that'll do it for you any time. Uh, so that's a that is a that's that is perhaps the best established of all observer signs, but there are many others. Now, I, some of you have heard me. I mentioned two others that I've given. Was it acronyms? What is it? To a person by a tightening of the anal sphincter. You know this term. And and the then Henry Phipps, professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, who was a smart man but very dumb on this occasion, asked him who. Which is really, it always brings a laugh, but it's dumb because <laughs> the, only, the only person that ever knows anything about another person's anal sphincter is a proctologist, right? And it has to be yours. It has to be one's own, the observer. Unless you're sitting in a very unlikely interview posture of these. And, uh, and then, in, then another, another one of mass, of mass mental claim to fame is Hendrick's sign, uh, which my predecessor in this room, Ives Hendrick, was associated with that was it? He claimed that that uh, I think it's in truth that the, the male residents in the presence of the flamboyantly hysterical patients have, tend to notice penile movements. And uh, that's called Hendrix So those are. There's also an old joke along with that. Who is the head of hospital? Pete Campbell. I never heard that. That's that's great. I can believe it. The uh, so those are those are observer signs. You see already what I'm what I'm trying to of how I'm trying to approach empathy and, and indications of the presence of the other. Because you, see, you literally feel the other. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. You know. Then we all know that the very, uh, the, the, perhaps the best, I mean, outside of psychiatry, the best known example of this phenomenon, of course, is crowd behavior. And, uh, the, uh, in fact, a lot of sociology is built on the transmission of affects in crowds. And uh, uh, some, of the, some of the first observations of this were those in, in which the hysterical dancing madness would be transmitted through whole townships. And then there are various other phenomena in which uh, affects are, uh, move through crowds. Uh, I think it's plain in depressive affects, manic affect, it may be true of all affects, anxiety, etc. And we all are familiar with the way in which manic people excite us and, uh, and uh, uh, his, you know, schizophrenic people leave us confused and uncertain, even a little flat. In the way in which depressed people react, these things are all are all observer signs, and yet fall within this sort of inadvertent empathy. Um, I like to I like to do what I call fossil diagnosis, and that is that I love to see if I can guess what the patient's diagnosis was by coming into the interview room after the patient has left to see what kind of imprint the patient has left behind. I call that fossil diagnosis. And it's, uh, it's very it's very effective because uh, you'll find that if the group is mournful and, and, and hopeless, and uh, you, which you're more often than not it's a depressed person, if they're excited and talkative, you may well have a manic person. If the nurses are looking disdainfully at the male doctors and vice versa, it's 
you have an hysterical person that has taken in the male doctor and the women can see what she's done to him and quarreling about that. Psychopathic people, in my experience, typically leave, leave behind them the presenter who's been taken in by the psychopath and has defended the psychopath while well, everybody else is aware of this. And so this the person in the middle of the room who's presented is being humiliated by having the, the, uh, the blinders stripped from his eyes. And other phenomena of the same kind that, in my opinion, bespeak this characteristic of mind that I've been trying to emphasize, the fact that mind is invasive, that mind is shaping, that it is an active force in our relationship with other people, that it is not something that sits there like the body and, and waits to be examined, it comes at us in many cases. Now these particular phenomena of, of observer signs are obviously signs of invasive mind, not retreating mind to a large extent. And therefore, they are things that we learn despite ourselves, you might say. They seize us. And uh, one of my hopes for this kind of line of thought is that, that by being more aware of this, one can sometimes turn these forces that are coming at one in productive directions rather than being twisted or overcome or misshapen by these very powerful forces. Well, that's what I'll stop there now and, I, and simply say that I'm going to then next raise this question, which is so vexing for me, and I hope you'll bear with my struggles with it, maybe help me in my struggles with it. And that is, that yes indeed, that does answer in part the question, how does one know where the other person is? And one feels the other person quite literally. However, it's also obvious that it's also obvious that there are other ways that psychiatrists and psychologists and all the rest of us have discovered of identifying the patient. There are all kinds of other ways. We see the patient, right? we think about the patient, we manage the patient, and, uh, and, I, and we have to therefore ask ourselves what the relationship between an empathic being with a person, what the relationship of that is to these, these other ways of finding the person. <coughs> and I will try to interest you in the idea that psychiatry really is, an, is a development of, of of four fundamental human faculties, seeing and feeling and, and uh, thinking and, and managing, manipulating, the heart, the eye, the hand, and the hand, managed, manipulated. And that each of the major schools is essentially a, a differentiation or extension of one major psychological mode. That descriptive psychiatry is essentially a development of portraiture, of seeing. Analysis is a development of thinking, number one, of verbal, thoughtful person Freud. That, that interpersonal psychiatry is really a development of the hand, of manipulation. And that uh, existential psychiatry, of course, is an extension of feeling. I'll go into that more next time. I hope, by the way, that you won't give up what your, one of your colleagues started by bringing patients down here. Any, any time. I'll make sure I'm quicker if I know that's going to happen. Where does intuition fit in the scheme of faculties? Among the, those mentioned as essential to the practice, I do that down the uh, manipulation. Well, it, it, um, uh, intuition has a, has a, a doubtful status in, in psychiatry, not because it's not perhaps the most important thing we do, but because its its meaning is disputed. Uh, I mean, take take up Cohort's discussion of intuition. That's a, we may have bumped into it in the Restoration of the Self, and he has a long passage about it in his first book, To the Analysis of the Self. Now, Cohort, and this is by no means the rule in discussions of intuition, opposes intuition and empathy. And Kohut says that intuition is what you think about the patient, not what the patient's thinking about. It's, it's your mental processes in relationship to the patient, as opposed to your getting with the patient, which is intuition, which is empathy. That's his view of intu intuition. And now, uh, Freud took a different view. Freud saw intuition, he doesn't think he talks very much about it, to my knowledge, anyway, but we didn't see intuition and empathy as as particularly separated. But he had a key, he had a key in one of his, and one of the few things I'm clear about that he said about that, he made this statement. Freud said that 
that with those we are already identified with, we can intuit what their lives are like. In other words, it's like saying, if I'm already in empathic connection with you, then my thinking about you will be somehow about you as well as about myself. And Freud says that you only need to empathize with those people who are not like you. I think it's true. In other words, if you're not already with them, you need to make some special effort to get with them. That's not exactly what he said, but that's the direction. But intuition is usually defined as a sort of spontaneous, uh, natural, free thought about the other. And its, its origins and status are not really not, never much to my knowledge, maybe you know better, never much better defined. It's just the word, and it's what you make of it. But I've heard a lot about it in the works of doing it, particularly in, in this volume on the theory of the personality, which involves a picture of the people that's all composed by more or less predilections of these four poles. He says that there are two poles devoted to the way you gather information and two to the way you process it. That there are those who primarily sense mm -hmm. and see is the major way of sense. At least sensory description tends to follow meta visual metaphor. Mm -hmm. And there are those who feel, mm -hmm. which is a more more of an affect of mm -hmm. thirty or so. Uh, then how you deal with the information also varies from person to person. And there are those who think about it, which mm -hmm. is just a grandiosity. Mm -hmm. And then there are those who intuit, mm -hmm. which he views as a way of processing a whole lot of information all at once. Mm -hmm. It's kind of uh, like a analog way compared with the digital sequential mm -hmm. parsing that takes place in, in rational mm -hmm. thinking. And he views it as a way, therefore, of dealing with information right. that's parallel processing and analog rather than linear and digital parts. So it's between synthetic and analytic. Synthetic and process analytic. of breaking things down into constituent parts. Mm -hmm. The process of, uh, yes. of uh, you were describing what, uh, what an intervention or a response, a clinical response to an intrusive or mm -hmm. invasive patient would be to, uh, to really try to not to reinforce the invasiveness or intrusiveness. And I was thinking of it in terms of what you were doing would be to uh, not to reinforce the very behaviors which would be preventing an empathic contact. Mm -hmm. my, my experience with patients that I've had being that uh, there's, there's really their intrusiveness and invasiveness and sort of have a presence that makes it more difficult for me to have an empathic right. sense of what's going on behind them. Right. Um, right. And I, don't you think it's also true that, that if you do shake someone like that so that they make at least a momentary recognition of you, that for the most part it doesn't get you very far right away. That they're often guarded by considerable fear of that closeness, no doubt with good reason. So that that you don't, at least in my experience, one doesn't want to follow it up too fast. One doesn't want to move in and turn too closely. That, uh, that they, they need to be at some distance. And although you'd like to cross that barrier, you don't want to cross it faster than they're ready to Way to have you come, or they're going to retreat in some other direction. But, uh, so I, I'm content if, in meeting a lot of people that are very, you know, into themselves, that they notice me maybe just once or twice in the course of a, a 50 minutes or so. It's almost as if they can sort of feel it's all right. And I've, and you sometimes have, I have something, I had the, the really remarkable experience of having been with somebody who really seemed to me pay no attention to me beyond say one or two little blips in the course of the whole time and then have them come in the next time or subsequently and say that they really had such a, a warm sense of being with in the thing and that they really felt closer to me than they ever felt to anybody and then I, threw, and, I and I took that quite literally that those two little blips were really more than they allowed themselves and that, that was really quite warm enough in a sense for at least I've been wondering something recently, maybe I've been various ways of thinking about this 
psychiatry, the job of psychiatry, and there are elaborations of, of uh, more or less fundamental human traits. Oh. It's an idea that we discussed once before. Uh, do you have a feeling that you can find, that you can predict who would be the better kind of psychiatrist for a particular patient who has a certain kind of characteristic. In particular, you know, should an obsessional patient have an obsession psychiatrist? Yeah. Or should he have an hysterical right. Or some other? Do you have a feeling about that? I, in, 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 the, in the larger way in which you're approaching it, I don't. I certainly have often felt that, uh, you know, that somebody would be too much like the patient, leave them you know, where they were, or even reinforce their attitude. In fact, that the patient might be further along than they are. Sure. And that you'd like somebody who's, who was close enough to them to bridge the gap, but not simply <coughs> stuck there. I see, I see psychiatric learning on that basis, too, and I, I think myself, all your own that we all come in with certain predilections of that kind, and that, the, that, this, that learning psychiatry is essentially enlarging those capacities of predilections. And, and, and one, I think, although it's, it's very difficult, and I think one probably imagines one's done it more than one has, nevertheless, it, it makes the work much more entertaining. I know when I started psychiatric practice, I was very bored. Because there were only two things we were permitted to do. One was to ask questions, and the other was to share the patient's experience. And, uh, and, uh, and I didn't, and I wasn't told how to share it either. So it was more a matter of sort of sitting there and hoping on the sharing it. And, uh, and it was very boring. And I think so, I think so. every now and then, late at night, when someone has had a little too much to drink, they'll. Many psychiatric patients will tell you that they're very bored. Very bored. Not so much at first, because then they're nervous. But after they've been in, in, in work for a while, they're very bored. And I think it's because they are really doing their thing too much. Too much. Too much. Too much. Too much. Well, it, the, the, thing that the thing that they do, and they do it in a, doing things that they don't do are learning things? Learning things, and also things that the patient needs in a clinical situation might need. Yeah. It becomes boring. I've had, I've had a number of, of practitioners as patients who, it seemed to me, have gotten bored with prescribing drugs or, or doing analysis. They become repetition. That they were no longer being surprised anymore in their clinical work, either by their own behavior or the patient. But that may not be represented. I mean, the whole notion of how you keep your life interesting, you know, without simply disorganizing it all the time. So, <laughs> that's so fundamental. You know? Well, it is sort of through a process of disorganizing. It's right. some sort of, uh, mm -hmm. it's not out of control. Right. It's self-directed sort of disorganization. Right. Yeah. Another, another terribly important part of that is the, is the whole attitude that one, what attitude one can take toward love in, 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 uh, in practice. I mean, one of the things I think that made uh, psychoanalysis so captivating to, to people in its early days was the idea of the transfer, that it's people would love you. And, uh, and that maybe Freud had found means by which that loving experience could be harnessed, could be used, could become therapeutic, so that you could combine perhaps two of the most fundamental human impulses, the impulse to love and the impulse to help. Um, and that seems to me that if there is a romance to psychoanalysis, and God knows enough intellectual romance to it, but if there's a romance in a more direct sense, it springs out of tapping into those really deep sources. That's one of the quarrels I have with ego psychology, which I think is produced an anemic, ineffective, endless, and, uh, poor psychoanalysis in its hyperintellectualism, in, uh, in its rationality, and lost touch with the you know, more visceral aspect. More visceral aspect. And if you really are like a like a mad surgeon, constantly flirting, not with death in that case, in the surgeon's case, but as they like to do, but but flirting with love. That really is what you're up to, to produce the maximum heat that the that the that the furnace can stand. 
which is a, which is it seems to me a fairly accurate way of talking about about uh, our work at its best uh, the maximum heat that the thing can bear but then uh, you talk about something very exciting well, I'll see you all next week I hope see you all next week I hope see you all next week I hope see you all